Our guest today is one of Silicon Valley's top product design executives. She was the first intern at Facebook in 2006 and helped lead the company's growth from just 150 employees to over 45,000. Early in her career, she was promoted to manager at the age of 25 and has led the design teams behind some of Facebook's most popular mobile and web services, such as newsfeed, photo sharing, and the ability to tag someone you love in photos. Her team's designs are used by billions of people every day. She also writes about technology, design, and leadership on her popular blog, The Year of the Looking Glass. Just last month, she made the exciting announcement that she left Facebook to start her own entrepreneurial journey and launched a new company, in Spirit, with a for friend and former Facebook colleague. Recognizing a need for a manual for new managers, she published her first book, The Making of a Manager, What to Do When Everyone Looks to You in March of 2019. It's an incredible resource for navigating the path from being an individual contributor to managing teams and speaks to the challenges and questions many new managers face as they make that transition. If you're interested in buying copies of her book for your own organization, please reach out to your BookPal account manager or contact us at sales at book-pal.com. We're excited to welcome our guest, Julie Zhu, to today's Author Connect chat. Welcome, Julie. Hi, thanks, Tony. Um, so you have an exciting origin story, and I think uh, you know talking to that initial promotion back at age 25 when your manager approached you uh, would be kind of exciting for people to kind of hear how this journey began. Absolutely. So I joined Facebook when it was about 100 people. So you know, think really startup-y, right? We everybody who worked there was either a recent college grad or had dropped out of college. Uh, and, you know, so we were just a bunch of kids and we were working on on a site that we knew and loved because it was a college site at the time. It was something that had just spread through um, many of the universities starting in the U.S. and it had just opened up to high school, uh, you know, not so long right before I joined. And so this was the environment that I was going into. Um, and so for me, it was, you know, it was really exciting to be able to work on a product that I personally used, that all of my friends used, and that, you know, we were all uh, the target audience for. And, uh, you know, we, uh, it was in a lot of ways, the, the company was our life at that time as well. It was almost like an extension, a continuation of college. Uh, but, you know, as our service continued to grow, uh, we continued to hire new people into our company. And so it was about three years later, um, after I had kind of been there and worked on pretty much everything that needed to be worked on at that time as a designer and as an engineer, that uh, our design team had grown to, to basically about 12 or 13 people. And, you know, we had one manager at the time. She wasn't really even uh, an experienced manager. She just happened to be one of the most senior designers on the team and the only person who had, uh, I think, any amount of you know management or leadership experience. So we all kind of voted her to be the first manager, <laughs> but our team had gotten to the point where now it needed a second manager just because she didn't have the time to be able to spend with all of the new people who were joining. And that's when she turned to me and she goes, well, you really get along with everyone on the team, you know? Um, so how about it? Like, can you help me manage, you know, the uh, half of the team? And uh, and I said yes, just because at the time I was always getting asked to do things that I had never done before. You know, in the startup environment, one day I'd be asked to, you know, uh, design an icon that we were going to ship later that afternoon. Another day I was going to go and like, you know, interview some people or like I was going to take like some you know visitor who was like a prominent maybe like city council member on a tour. So, you know, I, I was very used to kind of rolling with the flow and um, kind of just stepping up and, and doing what needed to be done. So of course I said yes. And I think I just did not really know what I was getting into. Uh, I did not know, you know, at that point in time, really anything about management um, or about leadership. I just knew that I had to have, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings with these new, you know, these people that were um, now on my team and that, you know, I had to kind of help onboard the new people that were joining. Uh, but that was really the extent of, of my understanding of management. <laughs> did uh, When did you start to seek guidance or... I realized that maybe some of the resources that you found on the bookshelf weren't sufficient uh, for helping you bridge the gap of knowledge. Yeah, uh, you know, I did. Uh, I think this was maybe six months or um, uh, uh, afterwards. I was like, oh, I should go out and like read all the management books that that I could get my hands on. And I went and, you know, um, 
went to the bookstore, I, you know, bought a bunch of stuff um, and I kind of worked through them. Um, but it did strike me at the time, even that there wasn't that much that was catered to just new managers, right? There were a lot of great resources, a lot of books that tended to be focused on like one big transformational idea, or, you know, in fact, many that were, that were written, uh, I think specifically for people who were already managers and who were maybe even executives and were looking to become even more effective. Lots of, lots of great resources for that. Um, but not that much that I think was geared specifically for me, because, you know, at that time I was, I was like, I hadn't been on some sort of career ladder. I hadn't been, you know, like kind of climbing at one run at a time. And now, you know, I've been 10 or 15 years in and, you know, I feel very prepared to take that on. Uh, um, and I think that was really one of the reasons why, you know, kind of 10 years later, uh, it, it was so important for me to write that book and, and write this now because I still felt like I remembered uh, a lot of what it felt like to be new to that job. You know, a lot of not just the like all the things I didn't know, but also a lot of the emotions that came from transitioning, you know, kind of the awkwardness of like having my first one on one with somebody who was a peer who honestly I thought did the job of, of design better than I did. And suddenly I'm, I'm his manager. Uh, and so, you know, I wanted to get that all down while it was still kind of fresh in my head because I knew that every year that passed, you know, I would become more and more distant from that feeling of being completely new as a manager and a leader uh, to the to the team. But, you know, I was very fortunate to be blessed with, in fact, a lot of other mentors and um, frankly, other people who were going through the same thing that I was going through. Um, you know, like I mentioned, many of us at Facebook, we were all kind of learning to uh, grow in our leadership as the company scaled. We were very fortunate to be a part of a company that was doing so well and that was able to grow very, very rapidly rapidly. And at a certain point, we started to bring in people who were extremely seasoned managers. You know, Sheryl Sandberg is one of those people um, and uh, many other wonderful, you know, leaders in uh, Silicon Valley. But also many of us who over time became leaders, we were of the same class where we were kind of all in it together. We were all learning together. We all had each other to kind of like talk to. And, and that mentorship and support group was also really, really important for us. That's incredible. Um, I was just curious because you touched on the one to ones with people who were, you know, your colleague the first the prior week and then now you're managing them. What I mean, what worked, what didn't work? I guess I, I've experienced that in past jobs and I've had friends who've experienced it. I guess, you know, is it best to acknowledge, you know, the shift in power or just kind of jump into, you know, the coaching, the the project management, the discussion? What what did you find worked well? So I think what didn't work well was what I did when I was 25, which is just pretend like nothing was, you know, was like, okay, I'm your manager now. And I pretended like I had to, you know, act like what I thought managers acted like, which was very uh, kind of authoritative, which was like very confident, which was sort of like, you know, the person who would have all the answers and know what to say or do. So I definitely did not acknowledge you know, the awkwardness and, and retrospect, I really wish I had because it wasn't authentic to what I was actually feeling. And I think that, that I think the other person, I think people can tell, you know, when you're kind of pretending like, you know, everything, but you really feel like you don't. And frankly, you shouldn't because you're new to it. Like everybody can see that, you know, and, and they know kind of it's an act. So why not actually be forthcoming? What I wish now that I had said, I wish I'd sat down with him and said, you know what? I'm new to this. I am, you know, I'm now your manager and, you know, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to be learning. I'm going to be growing. But I know that my job as a manager is to help you do your best work. It's to help our team be the best that it can be. And I can't do that alone. And frankly, I'm going to need your help and I'm going to need the help of everyone else on the team. And so how you can help me is you can help me by letting me know more about you and your goals, you know, what you care about, what you think you're good at, what you want to do more or less of. And I'm just going to listen because the more that I can understand you, the better I'll be able to support you. And furthermore, what I also want is for you to tell me all of your ideas for how our team can be stronger. I want you to tell me, you know, things that you think are going well and what and what you think is going poorly and what, you know, you think we should retool. And I'm just going to go and listen there and um, and I'm going to do that with everyone. And, and all together, we're going to come up with uh, the ways to make the team better. That's what I wish I would have said, um, because I think that would have been a lot more 
both, re you know, honest and real. And I think it would have um, enabled the other person to then see me as, uh, you know, an ally, as somebody who was not going to be in this like weird adversarial relationship, um, you know, but, but more like we're working together. And I think it would also help us all understand that the job of a manager is, again, not that I need to have all the answers and that I need to be this, you know, perfect person who is going to, you know, like say things and other people follow them. But that we're the job of the manager is really to kind of help the team do its best work. And that means relying on all the strengths that are already present, all the talent, all of the great skills, all of the people that are there. Right. I think uh, it's it's probably normal in any journey from transitioning from individual contributor to leader to have some level of anxiety. Uh, you use the quote in the book, uh, what am I bringing to the table? It sort of speaks to this idea. Um, you're also young, being 25 at the time. Uh, one of our listeners, uh, Yuri, asked about sort of the pushback of working with more senior people or certainly people of an older age and being a young person. But all of that sort of fits under this umbrella of anxiety and sort of how do you take that initial, you know, journey uh, of building confidence in your own abilities? Is it really just through the conversations on transparency with staff or are there other tips and techniques that you would offer? I think a really important part of it is, um, you know, I have a whole chapter dedicated to kind of managing yourself. And I felt that in fact, when I became more effective as a manager, oftentimes it wasn't that I, you know, one day, you know, practiced and this I became great at the skills. Usually because I realized some insight about myself, you know, I, I uncovered it, I like learned it, I internalized it deeply. And when I did that, it unlocked other, you know, uh, abilities or other ways that I was able to do things, right? So, you know, a lot of what I say to especially young managers is, uh, you know, you may not feel like you have all the answers. You may not feel like totally prepared for the job. And that is okay. That is part of, you know, being in uh, a leadership role, you know, and and the best thing that you can do for yourself and frankly for your own confidence is go into this with a beginner's mindset with the idea that you know um, you're going to go in it and you're going to learn and um, you're going to learn by doing but you're also going to learn by uh, learning from other people and um, and and just a kind of if you if you can admit that to yourself but then you know that enables you then to admit that to other people and if you're able to admit that to other people that is actually really really powerful because you will then receive so much more honesty support um, and frankly respect in in return because you know the people who are able to be courageous enough to say hey, I don't think I have this figured out but I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna invite all of you to kind of help me like when someone says that to me, I, I automatically have a lot more respect for them because I feel like, wow, this person is extremely self-aware and they're courageous enough to be able to say that to me and they're inviting me for help. So we're going to get the best results. And so, you know, if we kind of go approach management and leadership, not with the like, oh, crap, I don't know what the answer is. I must be a failure. But instead, I don't know what the answer is, but it's going to be, you know, part of my journey here is that I'm going to learn and figure it out. And I am not alone. I can rely on all the people around me to help me in that journey. That's the best thing that we can do for, for our confidence. That's great. Is um, there an evolution that occurred as well in terms of how the new Julie would have promoted the old Julie in terms of the sort of pre-screening and challenges that come with not everybody necessarily wanting to make the leap to manager. And you, you tell a story of one of your designers that you wound up losing because the management journey wasn't a fit for her. But how do you sort of approach that transitional element to people's responsibilities now? Yeah, I think it's really important to have a lot of conversations um, along the lines of, you know, like, well, why why is this interesting to you or why why might this be interesting because maybe sometimes you know that maybe it doesn't seem interesting to that person right but to kind of break it down and to actually look at what is management leadership and its component parts and you know um i talk about like a couple questions to ask that i think are extremely significant the first is around okay does this person enjoy or get energy from being with other people and helping to support and enable other people uh, because, you know, frankly, there are some people for whom what they really, really like to do is just be by themselves and go really deep on a hard problem and, you know, kind of work maybe in isolation or in quiet, you know, have like uninter uninterrupted, you know, two or three hours or five hours to just 
focus on a problem. And those types of people may be very, very happy actually to, to, to strengthen and further their craft uh, and become experts in whatever, you know, whether it's design, whether it's engineering, whether it's writing, you know, whatever it is, right, to, to kind of go and do that. And they may not actually enjoy a lot of the day-to-day -day of management, which in fact involves a lot of context switching. It, it involves a lot of meetings. It involves a lot of talking to other people. And that is just in fact, you know, because your job is to help the team succeed and the team is gonna be composed of other people. So naturally you're gonna to have to spend your, a lot of your time with other people. And if that doesn't bring you energy or joy or if it, you know, really, um, uh is it really like you know just that's not what you want to do in your day-to-day -day. you may not enjoy maybe a lot of the day-to-day -day of management that said i always go back to the other question of like well also what is satisfying to you you know is the satisfaction that you get out of your work the fact that you get to actually personally make progress on a problem or is the satisfaction that you can you can help make this problem be solved even if you're not the one doing the solving Right. I think for um, for a lot of managers, you know, the the joy of having a problem be solved through whatever means, you know, through other people, through through them working on process, through whatever, like that matters more. And it doesn't matter exactly maybe what role they're playing in the solving of that problem. And if that is the thing that that, you know, gives you ultimate satisfaction, I think you might enjoy a lot of the aspects of being a manager because it will mean that you're getting to you know do what most is important in order to solve that problem right which again goes back to usually it's hiring people or it's empowering other people it's coaching it's delegating it's um, letting other people play their strengths but if what you really enjoy is the the actual like you know i love the writing or i love coding or i love the actual like designing and putting the pixels on the screen then maybe the individual contributor track will be more satisfying to you. So I think it's really important to actually go deep and actually ask those questions, have those conversations, you know, with somebody who is considering management. And if they're not sure, then that's okay too. You know, usually what I look for is, um, okay, how can we get you to start doing some of this stuff that maybe a manager would be doing? And then you can kind of, you know, try it out and see how you feel. And so that might include, okay, you know, uh, maybe you can help, me run this particular meeting, or you can help set the agenda, or you can help, um, you know, create a new process, maybe for for how we, you know, share design work and critique, as an example. Or maybe you can be the onboarding buddy and the mentor for this new person who's joining the team, and you know, you're going to go and I'm going to expect you to meet with them weekly, and uh, you know, help guide them, you know, teach them the ropes, and um, and kind of be responsible for how how well this person integrates into our team so those are all little ways to, for somebody to try on whether or not you know some of the responsibilities um or uh or the day-to-day -day tasks of management is a good fit for for them great yeah, great advice um you kind of touched on meetings which is something that we talk a lot about here too um just how to better run meetings how to have effective meetings and you have a lot of content in your book about it, um, can you share some of your top tips for running successful meetings? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I was doing research for this book and it was shocking to me. Like there was a survey, you know, where people talked about, uh, you know, like how often they feel like they were in a meeting that was a waste of time. And like the number was just so shockingly high. And I was like, oh my God, you know, we all have to work on how do we, uh, you know, uh, make sure we protect our time and, and uh, ensure that we're in meetings that feel like a good use of our times. So the most important thing I go back to is, you know, if you're a meeting organizer, um, or let's, let's go, if you're just a meeting attendee and you're not an organizer, the best thing you can do is give feedback to the meeting organizer about whether or not the meeting was a good use of your time. And, you know, whether you walked away, uh, you know, feeling like, uh, wow, like I learned something new or I was able, I'm better prepared to do my job because I attended that meeting. I mean, that should be really the bar, right? And so if you're not feeling that way, then I think it's really helpful to just shoot a quick email to the organizer and say, hey, you know, that didn't feel like a great use of my time. Here's why. You don't have to be mean about it. You know, it's not, it's not trying to, you know, not like whistleblowing. It's just a way to, let them know so that they can take that feedback and try and either 
make the meeting better or you know if really it's not that worthwhile maybe it, it doesn't need to be there maybe you know an email can uh, be sufficient or you know a better memo or whatnot can take the place of that meeting right so so that's the first thing i would say if you're a meeting attendee um, as a meeting organizer, I think one of the best things you could do is ask your meeting attendees for feedback about about the meeting. Um, that that would be the first thing. Uh, but second, you know, to make sure that every meeting kind of has an outcome that you're shooting for. You know, I, I think I say outcome instead of goal or purpose because I think out, outcome is often a little bit more tangible. So if you're going to bring a group of people together, you should have a sense of like, okay, after the meeting ends. What do I hope will have happened? How do I hope these people will feel? Or what do I hope that they will have gotten away from the meeting, right? And there's frankly just, a, there's only a, like a handful of things that I, I think, you know, reasonably um, uh, meeting organizers want. One is like, maybe you want them to have better information about, you know, if you feel more informed or, or you know, so now they're better able to make decisions. Um, maybe you want to inspire them or make them feel, you know, a little bit more connected to the purpose of what you're trying to do or the mission, or, you know. Uh, maybe you're trying to make a decision, in which case your outcome is like, we need to have the decision actually be made. Uh, maybe it's just about, you know, sharing information, in which case you have to ask yourself, is the meeting format the best way to share information? Or are there other ways to have that information be shared that that would frankly be more effective at getting people to internalize that information? But those are, you know, you got to actually think about what is that outcome? And at, and then after the meeting happens, go and see if you got that outcome. You know, go and poll like two or three people and say, hey, this was I, this is what I was hoping you would walk away with. Did I achieve that? You know, and if not, then that means there's probably things that you can tweak or changes you can make to ensure that your meeting goes better next time. So you you kind of highlighted an interesting piece in there about the feedback element of you know kind of talking to that direct report about how that meeting went, did it achieve its mm -hmm. goals that idea of giving constant feedback can be a difficult element of management and you, you have a chapter about it but maybe speak to some of the lessons or best practices that you've learned where you want to prevent this idea of people becoming defensive that you're constantly critiquing them i mean obviously part of it is mixing in some positive feedback of course but um, maybe some ideas that you've learned over the years on delivering that feedback and, and making it a productive element of the process yeah. Yeah, so I'm a big believer that feedback is how we get better. And I think it goes back to that feeling of, you know, if you're a beginner and you're growing in with the beginner's mindset, the way that you're going to learn and grow the fastest is if you get feedback and, you know, you have an intention, you try something, did it work? You know, like the more that people can let you know about what's working, and what isn't, the better and faster you can move in and in, in towards achieving your goals. So, you know, that's just a, a general philosophy that I have. And, and oftentimes, you know, when I want to share feedback with others or ask for feedback for myself, you know, I always start out with that, like feedback is a gift, you know, feedback is how we help each other get better. And I think the most important thing I always ask myself before I give feedback to somebody else, especially if it's critical or negative feedback is, am I doing it in the spirit of trying to help that person? Because I'll also be honest, there have been times in the past where I have wanted to give critical feedback to someone because, you know, I felt like they needed to be taught a lesson. Or I felt that, you know, I wanted to come off sounding smart. Or, you know, some other set of reasons, which was not, I really want to help this person improve. And whatever I've given feedback, that is because of some, you know, reason that is like, frankly, you know, grounded in myself, right? It doesn't go very well because that person can tell and because the way that you're saying it and your tone is more about maybe you wanting to be right or you wanting to you know feel a certain way for yourself than it is about them and i think we're very good at, at kind of being able to pick up when you know something is more about that other person than it is about us right but if i go into feedback with the feeling okay i'm doing this i'm saying this because i genuinely want to help this other person that's the intention that i have then when I go in and approach them and talk to them, it becomes much easier because, you know, my body language, my tone, the way that I say it, it's going to be about how I, I can most say it in a way that helps them internalize that message and makes them feel that I am, you know, an ally and a partner and I'm just there to, to help and support. If I truly didn't care about that person, then I usually try not to give that critical feedback because again, it, it comes across and it's gonna be counterproductive. So first I have to care about that person. And second, I have to, you know, again, 
check my own intention and ensure that that's in a good place. But when that happens, you know, even sometimes like maybe I don't know that person well enough and it's still important for me to, to say something and I'm worried about how they're going to take it. Sometimes it, you know, if I, again, if I truly wanted to hear a message, what I, I'll say, because it's true is like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, Tony, I'm frankly nervous about telling you this because I really value our relationship and I want you to believe that, you know, I, I'm an ally for you and that, you know, we can have a wonderful and constructive relationship. Uh, but it felt important for me to tell you this again in the spirit of of helping uh the way that we work together sometimes just by you know sort of saying how you truly feel and that it's you know nerve-wracking for you it lowers the other person's defenses i think the third thing you can do which is also really really important is you can't just always be the one giving feedback right because then that just comes off really one-sided you know if i'm going to say this to you and and share that I'm, I want to follow up with like and by the way I also want to be really open to you know if I'm misinterpreting or if there's other things that I could be doing on my end to ensure that our relationship is as good as it can be you know at the end of the day any relationship is a two-way street and it's not always the other person it's us as well and so you know we only understand maybe or perceive our side of it but there might be lots of things as well that we can be doing to strengthen the relationship. And so also being open and um, and opening the door for, for that feedback to come in and for the other person to feel safe to give you that feedback. That's also, I think, really, really critical to the strengthening of the relationship. That's awesome. You, uh, this kind of falls under, you know, some of the teachings of Crucial Conversations, which is a book that you actually mentioned in your own writing. Mm -hmm. What other books have inspired you over the years or that you continue to recommend to people on your teams? Yeah, so Crucial Conversations, you know, it was, uh, you mentioned, it's the book that I think made me realize, wow, it is possible for any two people to talk about any topic, no matter how <laughs> difficult or awkward it is, like, you know, there is a way. Uh, I really love High Output Management. This was one of my, you know, kind of management Bibles written by Andy. Grove. Uh, you know, I was sort of hoping that like, you know, when I was in the process of writing my book, I was like, if people can, you know, think of it like high output management, but kind of a little bit more modernized uh, for a current time, like that would be a huge, huge kind of compliment. Uh, recently, I read Conscious Business by Fred Kaufman, and I loved it. I thought it was masterfully written. I think, you know, the stories are incredible, but also the combination of, you know, career and, um, and, and work and management with this kind of ethos of like, well, why does work matter to us? And how do we work and live in a way that's true to our values and, um, and make decisions uh, that are in line with, you know, um, the integrity, you know, the, that we want to hold ourselves to. So I think that was a really, really wonderful book. I always recommend uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck, uh, because this, you know, was um, really instrumental to me and helped me realize that, in fact, a lot of the times when I felt like I was uh, feeling like an imposter, or I felt, you know, um, you know, extremely, to your point, like, really nervous or that I couldn't do it, it was because I was coming into things with this fixed mindset that, you know, I had to be at a certain bar. And if I wasn't there, then I was a failure. And that book helped me shift my thinking to, well, maybe I'm not there yet. But, you know, I like if I just work on myself and, and every day I just, you know, try and do better than who I was yesterday, then then I'll um, I'll grow stronger. And the science behind that book was uh, extremely motivating. Uh, so those are those are probably my top few recommendations. Um, so I had a question. I know in past other conversations and interviews you've done, you've mentioned how Mark Zuckerberg did a great job of painting the vision for everyone and, you know, keeping you all motivated and, and on track to believe that you're going to hit, you know, a billion people using Facebook. We talk a lot about vision here. Uh, we have obviously plans for growth and continued growth. Um, just curious how he achieved that and how he did keep everyone motivated. Yeah. Uh, it's a really great question because I think Mark is so, so good at uh, thinking big and, and, and being able to make that extremely tangible, you know, and, um, and I think a lot of how he did that is he spent a lot of time kind of reflecting and thinking, you know, because before you can convince someone else of something, you kind of have to believe it yourself, right? And so, you know, it's, it's very difficult for us, I think, to, like, I've heard, you know, I've, I've sometimes tried myself to, like, paint a particular vision, but when it's like not clear in my mind, 
like I basically have zero chance of being able to make that clear for somebody else. And so a lot of it is honestly with vision. It's like, it's like, if you're the founder, you're the CEO, you're the leader and you're, you know, and people are looking to you for, you know, Hey, where, where's this going to go? Like making sure that you have enough time for yourself to be able to to think deeply and to come up with that and to refine it and to talk to different people and, you know, and everybody who prods it and, you know, pokes at it, right? Like, because the first time you come up with this like idea and you tell someone, they might be like, well, that doesn't seem realistic because X, Y, Z. And you're like, hmm, that's really interesting. I forgot. I didn't think about like why. And then you, you know, you take that feedback and then you like, you know, fiddle with it some more. You, you're like, you, you start, you try to make it a little bit sharper or clear in your mind. And when you do that, multiple times and what emerges at the end is like oh wow well, like a you really really believe it b you know you've at that point like or, or had enough people give you feedback such that you 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 can um you know you have good rebuttals to the most common questions or concerns that are going to come up from that and see you know you can actually speak to all of that you know in a way that is um clear and that is confident that's profound and you know so by the time you, you're like in front of hundreds or thousands of people delivering it you know it's like pretty well thought out, right? And so I think that process is actually really, really critical. You know, it's not the, like, it's not, like, I, I always say to people, you cannot go home tonight and like think of a vision and then like deliver it tomorrow. Like, you know, it's usually not that realistic. You're not gonna just somehow, um, like, you know, these things take time and it's the process of building to that confidence um, that that is critical such that by the end of it, like, yeah, you really believe it. And because you really believe it and it's so, so clear to you, you can go and, and convince like hundreds of other people that, that, that like they should believe it too. That's awesome. So we probably have time for maybe two more questions, but um, as that vision was unfolding and the growth of Facebook really started taking off, I mean, that's, it's massively different with 100 people versus 50,000. How did that sort of change your thinking of managing your own teams? And along that journey, I'm sure you've experienced losing some really talented people. You know, sort of the second part to that question is, how do you keep everybody rallied around that vision as some key employees maybe depart? Yeah, um, one thing that was really important, you know, well, I think there's a couple of things that were different from scaling, let's say from a team of, you know, five people to one that's, you know, 15 or 50 or 100, right? And I think the first is um, getting really, really good at, you know, um, it, like delegating and um, building and growing leaders. Um, you, you don't maybe need to do that as much at five because you know everybody can talk and you you can you have a very very good sense of what's going on within the team. But when you get to fifty or a hundred or five hundred or thousands, you know you personally as a manager have much less insight as to what's really happening on the ground. And so you need to rely on other leaders and you need to rely on a great system of leadership and management all the way up and down the chain such that you can still have confidence that you know the right things are happening and this gets to my second point which is the critical importance of values and of you know um, establishing strong values and norms you know like at a certain point like the team needs to have an identity right and i i mean that obviously at a company level but even specific teams within a company you know you want people to know well what do we what does this team stand for right what what are we here to do in our particular function or domain or discipline and how do we know that we're doing a great job you know those are questions that uh that i think continually need to like they always come up because every time someone new like some somebody new joins your team those are like the things that they want to understand it's like what does success of this team look like what are the norms you know and so forth right so that needs to be kind of baked into kind of the dna of the team um which is both you know what you say also what you do what what gets rewarded what gets you know sort of criticized um and and it needs to be not again what you as the leader does but it's also like like all all the way down right like so I think that when you look at large companies and they feel like they operate you know efficiently or they operate um you know with a sense of um clarity uh a lot of times it's because they have very very well baked values and they have um you know very uh, a, a clear sense of like uh you know what good looks like or what success looks like or what you know normal or taller like what's tolerated and what's not tolerated um and and that doesn't again come for free it takes a lot of like active cultivation and um 
And it's something that, you know, uh, constantly new situations will, will kind of test those values and, and, uh, and provide like a way for you to either evolve, refine, or kind of, you know, either further, um, define like what it is that you stand for. So, so I think, you know, establishing norms and values is really, really critical. And then I think the third thing, of course, is going to, you know, ensuring that, um, the, like that the people who are continuing to uh, join the team are, uh, uh, are, are like talented, are capable, and, uh, most importantly, are people who are going to continue to further your values. And, you know, any, company, any organization is ultimately a sum of its people. And so I go back to like, if you're a manager of a fast growing team, honestly, one of the most important things you could do is focus on recruiting, you know, focus on who are you bringing in and as the next generation of talent or as the next generation of leadership and ensuring that those people are set up for success and that they can, you know, um, understand uh, uh, like kind of like uh, both like what the team stands for and how they could be most effective. That is such great advice. Um, we could probably talk to you for hours. Yeah. <laughs> great, great advice, great content. Um, unfortunately, that was our last question for today. So I just want to let everybody know uh, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar next week. So do stay tuned for that. Um, also, next month on April 2nd, we'll be talking to Tony Saldana about his book, Why Digital Transformations Fail. Um, we also have three winners of the signed copies of Julie's book, which we're very grateful to have. Thank you, Julie. Uh, so congratulations to Daphne Robinson, Steve Arntz, and David Martin. Um, we will be getting in touch with you to uh, get your address information and mail those out. Um, and Julie, we just want to thank you again so much for your time. Uh, we learned a lot, and we're really excited to continue getting the word out about the Making of the Manager. And congratulations thank on you. your new startup. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Absolutely.